In his new book, Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake-up call from behind the lines, David Pepper outlines a pro-democracy agenda detailing how everyone from everyday citizens to business leaders can fight back against powerful politicians and hold them accountable. David is a lawyer, writer, political activist, and former elected official. He joins us now to discuss the book. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and, so, and David, your, your book is kind of really a, a frightening look into something that I, I've I've kind of been observing in the background over the past decade or so, but never quite put it together in in the way that you did. And you know, you you talk about how the media might love to focus on uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Lauren Boebert uh, because you know they they are pretty good at you know uh, a, a turn of phrase that's going to catch 24 hours of CNN headlines. Uh, but if you drill down to the state level, there are thousands of them serving in office now. Uh, is is are you seeing a difference in in kind when it comes to you know extremist politicians at the gra at the grassroots level than you did say a decade ago, or is it a difference yeah, in degree? Yeah, we, really, we really are. And the difference between Lauren Popert and Marjorie Taylor Greene is that they're on the outside looking in. They're you know, they're not the majority uh, in these states. People just like them are in the majority passing laws and gearing up to pass more as we get closer to, to 22 and 24. So these are people who are in power. And, you know, 10 years ago, you know, I've been around uh, politics in Ohio. You had conservative people, but you now have people who are who are being egged on, pushed forward. And we're seeing an explosion of these right wing laws at this moment on voting, on uh, how do you count ballots? And it's only accelerating. And one of the differences also is they never face accountability. So they just keep going, even when they are find, found to violate the Constitution because of gerrymandering. But basically, this is a generation of politicians who have essentially never been in a democracy. They've never worried about the next election. So they keep going, going, and going, and they learn as they go. So it only gets worse. Ha has gerrymandering gotten worse? Because obviously that's a you know that's a problem that's been around for for, for centuries for the for the entire run of the country. Uh, and you you I maybe I'm not sure if you would argue this or not, but there you know you we're seeing more of these extreme figures, extreme legislation. Even though we've always had that problem, has that problem gotten worse? It's worse. They've gotten better at it. They've perfected it. Just so Ohio, so my book looks at Ohio as a case study, but it broadens the map. So think about what's the matter with Kansas, but about democracy. And I'll, I'll just use Ohio, I know it's best. The 2011 gerrymander was the worst in our history, one of the worst in the country. And here's how bad it is. It's not just like 20 people who, who never faced a real election in Ohio. A majority or super majority of, of, of state legislators in Ohio average double digit wins. The, the entire majority is locked in, essentially, no matter how Ohioans vote. That's true in Wisconsin, Michigan. You know, it, majorities in Michigan and Wisconsin voted for Democrats for the state house in 2018, but the majority of the state house remain or supermajority remains in Republican hands. So they've literally corralled off the voters from their own politics, and that's why you know if you're the Koch brothers, if you're the Heritage Foundation. If you want to get really unpopular things done that serve your agenda at the expense of public outcomes, you go to the state houses because they can do it immune from popular will and they know it. And it never leads to accountability for them. And now it's turning into attacks on democracy itself, again, with very little accountability, as bad as they may become. What are the most uh, consequential laws that you're seeing some of these majorities pass when it comes to voting? I mean, basically, it, it, the, the, the scary part is some of the most uh, dramatic ones don't feel that big. You know, so you've got the traditional attacks on voting rights where they literally are pinpointing the exact reasons they lose. You know, after 2010 in Ohio, it was early voting. It was young people voting. It was it was something called Golden Week where you could register and vote in the same week. They pinpointed the exact things that they knew cost them Ohio in 08, and they target them. Well, they're doing the same thing after 20. Drop boxes, you know, a new round of voter ID. Drop boxes were hugely popular with voters of color in states like Georgia. So get, what are they getting rid of? Drop boxes. Um, so there's that kind of stuff. 
But then there are all the other attacks, and others have covered this, but they've gone from simply attacking voting on the front end to voting on the back end. And, and there are other new things that are happening. You know, we saw it first in 16 and in 18. When they lose an election to a statewide official, like in North Carolina, when the governor, Democratic governor won, or 18, Wisconsin, Michigan, they then start undermining the official who wins from the other party immediately. Uh, and they did that in 1618, got away with it. So after 20, what are they doing? Attacking secretaries of state. And here's the newest wave, and we saw in Ohio. We were very su successful winning Ohio Supreme Court races the last couple of years. That's one reason I think we're actually somewhat protected from gerrymandering in this cycle. What are they doing? They're changing the rules of how you uh, elect or select uh, state Supreme Court judges and justices. It, that gets totally lost. What are they changing think it about to? It as a matter of democratic governance. They are attacking a co-equal branch of government that is supposed to be a check and balance on them, and they're doing it out in the open, and it almost doesn't generate a headline. How, yeah, how are they changing the Supreme Court uh, selection well, process? Well, in Ohio, like North Carolina, they're frustrated that, you know, we had a candidate win by 10 points, a democratically endorsed candidate, win by 10 points when Trump won by eight. Massive overperformance. In Ohio, and I'm a lawyer, so I think it's a good thing, we've never had the party ID on the ballot for Supreme Court or any judicial candidates. They are, they are so frustrated that Republicans didn't know who to vote for, at least that's what they think, that they now are requiring party ID to be on the ballot. So you'll essentially have, you know, people who vote for Trump vote all the way down. In 20, that didn't happen for them, and they're very frustrated. It's what they did in North Carolina after they lost the Supreme Court there, and it worked. I mean, in other places, they're, they're going from nonpartisan selection processes to also make them partisan. So they're basically trying to take, in a lot of these states, the last independent branch of government that supports sort of basic law and order are these judicial branches. They're trying to make those as partisan as they have become through gerrymandering the legislature. I mean, Trump did win in Ohio, though, right? It's a it's a it's a state that's gone red. It's voted for yeah. a Republican agenda. So I guess how would you respond to maybe you know, the voters are getting what they what they indicated, what they asked for, and well, what they wanted in your state? He, uh, so Obama won Ohio twice. Trump won Ohio twice. Sherrod Brown won Ohio by seven. Mike DeWine won Ohio by four. In 2018, 50 percent of Ohioans voted for a Republican for the state house. Forty nine percent voted for Democrat. But you look at the state house, we're not governing like a state that's 50 to 49 or shared winning by seven or even Trump winning by eight. They are governing because they are rigged in districts they cannot lose. And there are many of them highly corrupt. They are legislating like we're Alabama. It's it's the representation just isn't working. It's it's warped. And essentially, these are people and this is something that should trouble, frankly, all parties, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, all across this country, we have a generation of state house officials who essentially have lived for a decade, their entire political existence, without real elections. They, they aren't standing in contested elections. Maybe they win one primary of five, by, you know, get 5,000 votes, their first election ever. Never again have they faced an election. In any system, that's going to lead to corruption, terrible public outcomes, no accountability. My book is not, I'm a Democrat. I'm happy to be a Democrat. But this book isn't just about Democrats. It's a broken system. It's a non-democratic system we're stuck with now in, in state houses. And because state houses have so much power over elections, over other things, but over democracy, the fact that these systems have broken down to being undemocratic is having huge negative and, and disturbing consequences overall in politics. And what is the way to unwind that once you have so many pieces locked in? Well, well one, you know, I lay out 30 steps and, and, and uh, my worry is there's a law right now where we're almost accepting it. You know, we, every couple of weeks there's some crazy state law somewhere. The nation freaks out, there's a lawsuit, there's a boycott, but then we move back to some DC story and no one ever stops and thinks, what the hell is wrong in these state houses, pardon my French, and how do we stop it? Well, my book tries to lay out how we do that. One, this, the founders understood the risk of this, and they would expect the federal government to step up 
in past things like voter protections when states are undermining the democracy with, of their own voters and, and, and in their own states. But two, we can't only wait for the federal government, although its role is essential. Every voter in this country needs to know that those state houses have as much to do with their lives and their democracy as, you know, or more so than Congress, Marjorie Taylor Greene. And so the book calls for multiple ways for individual citizens, activists, nonprofit leaders, local elected officials to all get involved in a sort of pro-democracy approach that, you know, honestly would look somewhat what we do with other countries. It, if we saw another country falling away from democracy in the way that our states are, you know, attacks on courts, attacks on ways that the opposition votes, um, one thing after the next, you know, rigging districts so you can never lose, even when the majority of voters are voting for the other side. If we saw that in another country, let's say Hungary, we'd actually say they're falling away from democracy. We have to do something about that more globally than just one lawsuit. But we're not doing that in America. We assume that our states are fine, even though, frankly, many of them are not. So the book lays out a number of steps. I hope people will read the book to read these steps of how you can get involved. And it, it means you know, local elections, state house elections, registering voters all the time and creating a much more pro-democracy, bigger than one party approach that, that frankly, with not a lot of time left, my hope is will help push back the other way. But here's the lesson our history shows us. This is very parallel with the Jim Crow era. If we don't fight back, the forces who are pushing against democracy prevail. That's yeah. been true in our country. It's been true in other countries. So people have to fight back from, you know, the people in Congress down to local activists. The book is Laboratories of Autocracy. David Pepper is the author. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. Take care. Stick around. We'll be back with more Rising up next. <laughs>